All right, hello everyone. Let's start 10 minutes late. Is it 10 minutes? The class starts at when? 40. 40. Whoa, 14 minutes late. Holy moly. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, happens. All right, so uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to say was uh, um, um, thank you very much for the, uh, the person who allowed me to record the, um, the uh, create uh, getting an appointment on MS Teams. The recording is now in your uh, uh, GitHub repository. All the recordings are going to be there as we are going through the, the sessions. Uh, people, are keep, people keep asking for some reason, uh, but when you are going to the notes for OP244, so going to the organization of OP244, there is over here um, NAA and ZA8 notes. And if you go to NANZAA, click on your own section, you will see that the notes are there and also the recording and every and each thing that we are doing. So you click over here, uh, it either opens big blue button or YouTube, depending on where the recording is recorded. <coughs> um, and the notes are all up there too. So actually, let me just take a look at it and see what we have talked about. So we talked about uh, encapsulation, we talked about polymorphism, we talked about inheritance, what they are, and we also talked about namespaces, understood what namespaces are and uh, why we use them. Then uh, <coughs> we went through overloading the uh, uh, functions, the first aspects of object orientation. We said that whenever you create <coughs> um, Whenever you create a, a, a function, you can actually overload that function having the same name and different arguments as uh, uh, I have done here. So essentially, if the, if the function carries the same name but different uh, types of arguments, uh, the compiler, based on the signature of the a function in C++ will pick up the correct version and call it. And we said unlike C, uh, functions in C++, the signature of function, is function the signature of functions in C++ um, is their name and the arguments passed to it. <clears throat> when we were overloading, we noticed that one of the overloads that we are doing is exactly the same overload, uh, exactly the same logic that we had with the other one with the arguments simply missing from right side that was setting that value to a default value. And we said, whenever that thing happens, it's a good idea instead of implementing a new function, tell to the compiler where we create the prototype of the function that if the second argument is missed, replace the value with this. So therefore, by adding a default value for an argument, essentially you are overloading the function with two different signatures. But if the removing the arguments from right side doesn't work, like this one that has an integer at the beginning, then you have to overload it. There is no other way. OK? That was function overloading. We did the function overloading. And the final thing we talked about was references. <clears throat> we said that. Uh, uh, Unlike, uh, unlike C language, that whenever you want to access something remotely, you had to pass its address through. So if you wanted to, uh, you can't see a thing over there, can you? Let me just do something in here that's going to help you. Because you have the screen. They don't. They don't. <laughs> All right? All right. I think that's going to be better. OK, so. <clears throat> We said that, uh, um, uh, yeah, you pass the address. So if you wanted to change something remotely, instead of passing the variable, you took its address, passed the address, and in the function that you were uh, manipulating that, instead of dealing with the pointer itself, you dealt with the target of the pointer and therefore re uh, modified things remote. Now, how this thing relates to that, we're going to come to it in a second. In C++, there is a feature called references, which are essentially aliases. You can create aliases for different things, which means you can have one instance, and we talked about instances for like 45 minutes to see what instance means. Uh, so 
instances. Yeah, um, just trying to find another word for it. I cannot uh, uh, come up with anything. So, uh, um, uh, whenever you create instances uh, instance of a, of any type, compound or or primitive, it doesn't make any difference. You can actually uh, instead of creating a new one, if you just want to deal with the old one, but you want a different name for some reason, I don't know, you got bored or something, you want to call it the new thing, you can always create a reference to it, which means you are not creating a new variable, new object, new instance, you're just giving the old thing the new name. We gave this example over here, we created an integer i, and then they were created an integer reference r that is set to i. Over here, the value of i is not going to r. What happens, r becomes a new name for i. So r and i are identical things. Uh, I'm going to close this one and go back to Visual Studio, because like that, we can actually mention that uh, and, and point to it better. So essentially, what we had was this. So we said that we said that when I create a reference like this uh, uh, to prove that they are all in the same location and this is not a new variable getting created, I started printing the address of every single thing that I created over here. So I said integer i and integer r. When I showed the address of r and i, we noticed that the addresses are identical. Therefore, they are actually same object in memory. They are not two different things. Uh, and that was that. So r and i, so when I say integer reference equals to something, I literally am giving the, the, the object a new name. My name is Fardad. Remember, call me Freddy. So Freddy and Fardad, same thing. No difference. If you ask questions from Freddy, Fardad's going to answer. If you slap Fardad in face, Freddy's going to hurt. It's the same thing. No difference. Are we good? Then we came to the point saying that because aliases in nature cannot exist without an already existing thing, I cannot create an alias without having a name already. It's nature of an alias dictates that you have to have something, you give it an alias. Like, this is a bottle, from now on I'm going to call it a pigeon, okay? So, so you have to have something to name it something new, okay? So that thing is actually enforced in C++. It means you cannot just create a reference. You have to initialize that reference with an already existing object. So it becomes a new name for that, for that object. We showed you that by, by removing the I from here and showing, showing you that compiler actually generates an error telling you that, hey, a reference variable R requires an initializer. Local variable is not initialized, which means you have to initialize it to something so it can actually exist. Are we OK down to this point? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? Yes, ma'am. How is the value of what? The R. They are the same. When I set R to 30, I becomes 30. When I, they are not two different things. Just, just try to imprint that in your, in your mind. That when you create a reference, nothing new is created. I have one integer in this program only okay. that has two names. So if I write r equals to 30, or if, I, or if I write i is equal to 30, same. No difference. We good? All right. Now, we need to know an important mechanism. So in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this uh, a reference review. And come back to my program and talk about something extremely important in here. Something that we need to know from IPC that should be taught the very first day you are taught about functions in IPC. Okay? Uh, and this is the fact. How the functions are called. Okay? 
Before we start dealing with how the functions are called, we have to understand the difference between initialization and setting. And my friend with the microphone is going to try to explain to us what that is. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. What is, <laughs> what, is the, what is the difference between initialization and setting? So what is the difference between these two statements? If I say, what is the difference between line 5, 6 and line 4? So five, six combined, and four. What is the difference between the two? Do you think there is a difference? Yeah, and not in syntax. If you don't know, just pass it quickly. The lady knows the answer, wants dies to answer. OK, what is the difference? Uh, I think the difference is the J is undefined at the beginning, and then we can assign the value or any. That was golden. So it says the difference is that. When i is created, it comes to being with 3 in it. When j is created, first it's got to have garbage, then we overwrite the garbage with 3. That's the difference between initialization and setting. So the assignment you see at line 4 is not assignment. It is initialization. I'll prove it to you. So in here, first of all, in here I'm going to say C out I. And in here I'm going to say C out J. And in here I'm going to remove that and do this. Completely remove the assignment. If I run this program now, run forest run, we get build error. Why? Three lines of code and a build error. Oh, it's <laughs> this is the compiler is getting smarter now. It's telling me, hey, J is not assigned. Why are you printing it? It's garbage. You want to see garbage? Okay, so it in old days that would actually run perfectly and you would see garbage. Okay? Now it's telling me that you cannot run it. OK? So it's the compilers are getting smarter. But yeah, so, so now if I remove that one, yeah. So anyways, you will see that it runs. They're both three, as you see. <clears throat> so this, ladies and gentlemen, now remember, this is a turning point in OOP244. You're going to need this three weeks from now. Assignment at the moment of creation is initialization. It's not assignment. Assignment at the moment of creation. So these three are the same. They all act exactly the same in C. They are initializing value of, of integer values that are in front of them, all to three. And they are all exactly the same. The last one is the newest version, aggregate initialization. OK? So that line number six is the new one, when you can put curly bracket in front of anything to initialize it. And if you don't put anything in it, it defaults it, whatever that default value is. So if this j that I had over here, I just did this in front of it, then the compiler would allow me to actually run it. I could actually go see out j and L with no problem because now I, so what is the default value for an integer? All the bits set to zero, which means is, seriously, zero. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me. I say all bits zero. I say, what does that mean? It means zero. So it's all going to be zero. So first, so this is the first important thing that I, that I explained. So we understand assignment at the moment of creation, line number five is not an assignment and it's initialization. Am I going through to you guys on this? Are we okay with this? Now next, next, next topic. That is what I asked my friend to remind me over here. So B over here, difference between 
assignment and initialization.cpp. Wow, such a name. All right. <clears throat> How functions are called in C language? It's not C++, it's C. Okay? I have a function called, uh, let's go with that line thingy. Where is that line? Let me just bring it up. Uh, let me, mm, I'll, I'll, I'll do foo. Okay? So in here I'm going to have void foo, and I'm going to have integer a and character pointer p. Okay? And in here I'm going to say, C out A and L C out target of P or P actually and L. And I'm going to call it SDR. Again. Doesn't matter. Okay. <clears throat> I have over here integer value and I set it to 1, 2, 3. And I have over here character. Uh, name uh, and it's set to, you can actually do this, uh, I forget it, uh, Fred. Okay? Are we okay with this? Now, when I write over here foo val name, how foo is called? If I run it, we know what the outcome is. It runs and it prints those two variables. There's no problem with that. Okay, but how behind the scene it is called. When a function is called, ladies and gentlemen, when a function is called, this is how it's called. Foo int a equals to val const character pointer str sets to name. What does it mean, this line? I just taught it to you. Assignment at the moment of creation is initialization. So essentially, a, when the function is called, the arguments of the function are initialized by the values the function is passing to them. Do we understand this? Is that clear for everyone? Because the next point is going to be something amazing. Are we okay with this? All right. This is not C, this is C++. But this one is C now, C++ now. So, remember I told you that references cannot get created, they have to be initialized? What am I doing? Seriously? Really? Okay. Uh. Get used to do this. When you create something, open a close a curly bracket in front of it from now on. Make that a habit of yours. It means you're just initializing them to whatever they are supposed to get initialized. You don't need to worry about it. If it's a double, it's got to be 0, 0.0. If it's integer, it's got to be. If it's an array, everything becomes 0 in it. OK? You don't need an assignment, anything. Just do it that way. Poof. OK? Now I'm going to do this. Get num number. No address, nothing. I just do this. And in here, I'm going to say, see out. You entered. Let's analyze and see how the function is called. We just told you how the function is called. So when get num is called, what's going to happen? It's going to call get num integer reference val set to number. What does this, this statement mean? We just taught you. It means val becomes 
alias of number. It means val becomes a new name for number. Therefore, anything you do in val in get num will happen to number outside. No pointer is needed. Yes. So the reason you would do this is so just using int val or pointer is because it's memory efficient. Because it's beautiful. What do you mean where is you? You just you if you wanted to do this, if you wanted to do this C way, this is what you had to do. I have to put an integer pointer in here, right? Then I have to say over here target of val. Then when I'm calling it, I had to call it like this, address of number. Why? Because in here it has to be address val is equal to address of number. Which one is easier? This with all these garbage or just aliases open amazing things. Okay? So aliases become amazing stuff. It, it help, they help you extremely memory efficient, which means nothing new is created. You get rid of all those pointer pointers. We still need pointers. You're going to see that the time comes that references become difficult to work with. Um, you will see why. It's not difficult because, like, because of lack of knowledge, but there are places that pointers cannot be used. Okay, but I have to tell you, behind the scene, without you knowing, references are actually pointers. <laughs> But compiler said, instead of bothering people to put ampersand stuff, I'll do it for them. So they added it to the language. And it creates beautiful things. I'll explain why. So now if I run the program, they both, thank, thanks to operator over uh, function overloading, they both work. I don't need to give it a new name. They are both get number. One works for the, with a, uh, address, the other works with a reference. So now if I run the program, you will see that three years later when it runs, it comes in here. So as we see, it comes up over here. Now val becomes a new name for number, which is zero. Enter a number, gets the value, and I put over here one, two, three, four, hit enter. Now val here becomes one, two, three, four, and when I come out, Number over here is one, two, three, four. And therefore, one, two, three, four is entered. In here, however, what happens is that a new variable called val is created. So something is created over here where over there nothing is created. It's just a new name for an already existing thing. In here, a new variable called val created, eight bytes, to hold an address. What address? address of a number. So when I go in here, when I go up in here, val is actually an address that points to 1, 2, 3, 4. You see that? Now I'm going to say enter a value, and in here I'm going to say get the value and put it in target of val. Remember, never say asterisk val target of val. So it, put it, it puts it in target of val, and therefore, that's going to be an integer. And here now, I can put over here 4, 3, 2, 1, and I hit enter. Obviously, val remains the same, but the target is changed. What was the target? It was the number. Therefore, the number becomes 1, 2, 3, and yada, yada, yada. Are we OK? References in C++. And these references can do crazy stuff that's going to come on come out very handy uh, in future. Let me show you why. So this is reference is very easy. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm telling like whenever a new concept is added, you can take that concept in, an, in another point of understanding. Now take a look at this. Let's say, did I save it? Did I save it with a new name? No, I didn't. So it's the references. Now take a look at this. Let's say I have a file scope variable over here, double tax, and I put it 0 0.7. Are we okay with this? Problem with this? 
in here I'm going to say double tax value return tax. Are we okay with this? So I can say C out tax value. Oh, not that. If I, what happens if I do this? Ah, forget it. It's 244. Uh, so if I do this, it's going to print 0 0.7. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this, people? Now take a look at this. Can I do this? What the hell that means even? Right? That doesn't make sense. I can't do such a thing, can I? Of course I can if I do this. What just happened? It's not magic. Tax value is returning a reference, correct? Reference of what? Tax. So the whole function name becomes a new name for tax. Ta-da. Now you can actually put a function at left side of assignment operator. And it runs exactly the same. You don't need to understand this perfectly now. Later on, it's going to make much more sense. But I don't know why am I walking through this. Control F5. Uh, stop. Yeah, so it is this. So it actually changes the value. So you can, you can bring a function to the left side of assignment operator if you make it a reference, return, if you return a reference of a modifiable value. Because it is returning a reference, it becomes a new name for what it's returning. It's as simple as that. When I give you a definition, take that definition and run with it. When I'm telling you a reference is a new name for an already existing thing, anything that returns a reference can do that. Not only a variable. Right? Right? Are we okay with this? Yes, sir. What? Don't, don't try to take philosophy in there. It's simple. Tax value returns a reference of what? Therefore, it becomes a new name for tax. Yeah, you're changing the original value because tax value is a name for tax. Are we OK? The trick was that that tax was a global variable. It existed when the function is over. If I had the local variable, I couldn't return its re reference because it's crazy. It means return the reference of something that is dying. <laughs> you can't do that, right? If, if it was a local variable, it was bananas, right? So be aware, OK? The trick was that. So I'm going to call this crazy reference uh, until it becomes non-crazy in future when we learn to do some nice stuff. Okay, so in here I'm going to call it crazy reference, which means if you don't understand it, don't worry. It's got to be crystal clear later on. Yeah, so um, I have some examples of reference and stuff. So this is a good example of exactly what I've done over here. Now nah, forget it. it's going to be too confusing. Let's not talk about that. OK. So now we know what references are. So essentially, if you pass an argument as a reference, that argument becomes a new name for whatever that is coming in. And if I return a reference with a function, the function becomes a new name for whatever that is returning. Keeping that in mind, let's go and understand, understand what uh, 
This is good, actually, what arrays are. So I'm trying to uh, how many people think genuinely that they understand what pointers are? How many people think that they almost know what pointers are? OK, so uh, I might put an extra session offline some Saturday or something uh, and ask you just come and we talk about pointers, OK? Uh, pointers have been given ex too much credit. Like, they, 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 they are, it's like a boogeyman, you know what I mean? They, they make you scare of it, where it's just something very simple. Very simple. Pointers are nothing but variable. It's like integer a, now we have double. <gasps> what is a double? Nothing. It's just another variable. It holds things with partial stuff. What is a pointer? Pointer is a variable that holds location of memory. It's just some type of an integer, weird type of integer that is only positive and uh, uh, calculation with it, but it's uh, all it is. And because we have so many different things, pointers can be so many different things. You write integer pointer, it means integer pointer p, p is just a variable, just a regular variable like integer i, but job of p is to hold an address of an integer location in memory. And what is address? Address is essentially you counting from the beginning of your memory, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and go to see where this byte is in memory, in physical memory of your computer. That's the address. Um, having said that, What is really an array? When I say array, actually, what does it mean? <sighs> when I write over here, integer main A5, I have five integers in here, correct? But that's not really what happens. How the compiler simulates this, this is how it's done it. It says C language. C language is a middle level language. You know what middle level language is? Who, is, who has the microphone? Uh, you know what a middle level language is? High level language? Um, like the language that is closer to human language. Thank you. And what is a low level language? A language that is closer to computer. To computer. So what is a middle level language? It means it does both. OK. C is like that. C is a middle level language, which means you can go bananas with it and do you, can, <laughs> you sat in a wrong spot, my friend. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. what I was saying was that uh, it's a middle-level language. So you can actually, uh, it, 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 it tried to implement all the, all the stuff that it had very close to its real design. If you do programming in languages like... Uh, Java, or uh, which are more higher level language than C, or God forbid, COBOL, <laughs> or something else. So, like languages, like when you create an array, they an array knows what is its size. An array, uh, so if you exceed the size of an array, the language is going to complain. And when you create an array, they say array has an index, and the index of the array shows like uh, like which element of the array. So it deals with that that way. But C doesn't do it that way. So what C does is that when you create an array, it says, you are saying, I want five integers. It says five integers. It asks the OS to give it or occupies in its executable five integers back to back in memory. And then gets the address of a beginning, puts it in a pointer. So that A that you see over there is nothing but an integer pointer that is pointing to the beginning of those five integers. So from what I'm saying, if I do this, target of A, it returns the first element. It prints the first element. Correct? An array is a pointer. Pointed. And if I want to go to the next one, so essentially if I go over here, integer 
pointer P set to A. If I go C out P2, it's as if I'm using an array. Correct? Pointers, arrays, potatoes, potatoes. Are we okay with this? The only difference between a pointer and an array is that array is a constant pointer, which means you cannot change A itself. A is doomed to always point to the beginning of the array, right? Where P, I can change its values. I can actually do this. I can say P is equal to address of A1, let's say, or A2. Then if I do that, P2 is not going to be 30 anymore. P2 is going to be 50. Because now P is pointing halfway through the array. It thinks the first element is 30. Right? That's how arrays work. And that's why C language doesn't know what is the size of an array. Arrays are nothing but pointers. If you keep going, it's going to keep going in memory. It doesn't care if you have something over there. You have to remember that you had it. So please keep that in mind. Arrays are not intelligent in C or C++. They just are a bunch, a place in memory, and you're pointing to the beginning of it. Are we good? Yes, sir. You don't add four to the add. That's the thing. Pointers are, are very creepy integers. So just to show you, what I mean is this, integer pointer P is set to address of A, oh, not address of A, A, and I'm going to go CI unsigned P. So I'm essentially asking the compiler to convert so I don't want it to be hexadecimal. I want to see exactly where in memory my array is. So this is the address, actually, if you can read that number. That, so start from zero, count that many. That's where in my memory, my integer is, the array is beginning. Look what that number is. You see it's eight? Of course, every time I execute it's somewhere else in memory. But well, take a look. So by math definitions, if this address is 10, this one should be 11, correct? By math. But that's not the case. Look. What is 52 minus 48? What is that? It means size of an integer is 4 bytes. When I add 1 to a pointer, because it's a pointer, it's a weird integer. It knows that it's, because it's an integer pointer, it knows that it's pointing to an integer. When you add one to it, it adds size of one integer to jump to next integer. And that's how arrays work. So essentially, that index that you put in front of it is nothing but this. So instead of saying P2 over here, I can say C out target of A plus 2. These both are the same, identical, no difference. See, 30, 30. So this is how compiler calculates what to show you. Either you put square bracket because you're scared of <gasps> target of, so you put that one or this one. This is potatoes, this is potatoes, the same thing. You're simply saying add two integers to the address of A, show me the target, give me the target, or you're saying Add 2 to the address of A and give me the target. The exact same thing. Are we good? We understand what arrays are? Yes. And I say arrays in C because it has nothing to do with C++. What you see right there is actually C. We are not dealing with C++ at the moment. <clears throat> 
And that brings us to the next thing. All right. I need to look for a slide now. All right, so let me put this right in here so I don't have to go around. And it's right in front of my hands. And so we said that when we design, uh, when we create a uh, let me see if the uh, presentation is uh, set properly. Yes. So that's what we said, right? That's we, what we just talked about. We said that when I create an array in, in, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in my program, essentially in my executable, it puts that number of things and then gives me the address of the beginning, right? That is why every single time you're writing a program, you have to think how many things I have, and then you multiply it by 10, and then you write the program just in case the number grows. So somebody tells you, we're going to give you some marks, and I, and I want you to find the average. And you say, how many marks? And you say, the guy says, I don't know. You say, guess. The guy said, 10. You put 50, <laughs> right? And then you put a size, and they keep adding. So you create an array of 50 integers and probably use the first 12, and the rest goes to waste. And essentially, that's how, how much bigger your uh, uh, executable become. So the more the array, the bigger the executable file. Because everything is in the executable. When it's loaded into memory, the, 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 your array goes to memory, you use it, and when your program is done, operating system removes your application from the memory. Everything inside your application, is, in, including the arrays and all the stuff, they're all gone. Are we okay with that? We're going to learn to do something new, which means I'm not going to create my array at compile time anymore. This array is created at compile time. So when it compiles, it engraves that array into my executable. Now that I know this array is nothing but an integer, but, but, but a pointer, in my program, I only create a pointer. And when the program runs, I'm going to ask the user, how many integers do you have? After the user gave me answer, instead of asking the compiler to create an array of that many, I'm going to ask the operating system that is running my program. So your compiler is gone. Your program is running. Your program asks the operating system, give me 10 new integers or 35 new integers depending on how many uh, things the user wanted. It gives you exactly that much. You make your pointer point to it, now you have an array. The catch is that because you asked the operating system to give this to you, you are responsible to give it back. If you don't give it back, what's going to happen, the next person with the microphone, you think? When you don't give the memory back to operating system and your program ends, you will have no, not at all. Actually, the program doesn't crash at all. What happens? What is it? I'm going to have what? Anybody knows? A memory leak. <laughs> no, that's not fair. Um, um, yeah, a memory leak. Have you, ever, have you ever, like, saw that your internet connection is gone? You call Bell or Rogers and say, I don't have internet. It says, Unplug the modem, count to 15, and plug it back in. Why do you think that is? Because the person who wrote the program didn't take care of the memory properly. And every time a new connection was made to internet, a little bit of memory was left unreleased. 
as these going over two, three months, your memory is filled with garbage, no more memory for your program to execute, hangs. What do you do? Unplug it, everything gets reset, put it back in, poof, you have memory again until two months. And then they see this is happening too much, they issue a firmware update where the guy went over there and says, what the hell did I do? And they try, okay? So let's see, and that's one of the things. So how do we do that? How do we actually do that? So in here I'm saying, <clears throat> I'm gonna say, so in here I'm gonna have something like a size to ask how many integers I want, and then I'm gonna have the integer pointer P, that's beautiful, and as I mentioned, oh, we always put this thing over here to make sure everything's null, right? So I have blank stuff. Now in here I'm going to say see out how many ints and the user tells me something, right? So see in size, right? Down to this point I recognize what the size is. Now I have to ask the OS to give me that many integers. How do I do that? I'm going to say, operating system, give me new integer. How many? Size. That new, you know what does it return? The address of those things in memory. It's not in your executable anymore. It's in some place we call heap. So it actually goes to the shared memory of your computer where all the applications are using and gives a chunk of that one, size integer one, returns it to you. All you need to do is to put that one in P. And now P is an array with size integers. Now you can say for, how did it come out to do? For uh, integer i set to zero. I'll actually let me just bring an integer up there. For i set to zero, i less than size and size and i plus plus. I can actually say c out something like i plus one and c in into pi. And the beautiful thing is that the array matches exactly how many integers I have. Not one more, not one less. I'm not wasting any memory. And I can print them in reverse order, for example, now. That's one of the things that I always mention to students. What if I told you, uh, write a program. It's a very simple program, the one that I'm writing now. Like if with your C knowledge, that's impossible. If I told you, write a program that receives unknown number of integers and prints them in reverse order. You can't do it. You say, okay, how many? I say, I don't know. You say, guess. I say, I don't know. It could be five. It could be five billion. Then you're like, I don't know how to write the program. Now we know. Now you can print it in reverse order if you want. So size minus one, obviously, i greater than or equal to zero, minus minus, and I'm going to print them one by one. So, and then at the end, the most important thing, I give it back to operating system with many thanks. So I'll go delete, and I deleted exactly how I created it. I created an array. I'm going to say delete array P. Allocate, deallocate. There must always be company. If you forget this, compiler won't give you an error. The problem is that because you didn't say array, it's going to only deallocate the first element. So if you have 50 integers, the first one's going to get deallocated. The rest, 49 of them, will remain in memory. So you have to always remember the way. So if I just said new int, it becomes one integer. When I put the size, it means many. So if you are allocating using square brackets, you delete using square brackets. If you are allocating without squ uh, uh, square brackets, it means you are allocating only one, then you put one. But in here, I'm going to do it like this. So this program of mine, if I run it, 
three years later, it says how many ints. I'm going to say four. Now it's going to actually get the values from me. What did I do? Oh. I should have printed that. I see in it. <laughs> Sorry about that. My apologies. Uh, see out. I got too excited. So now if I run it one more time, I'll go four. Uh, one, two, three, four, and it's going to print it in reverse order for me. Okay, and program ends. The difference is that now my program is like this. The pointer is in there, the array is outside. My executable is smaller and more efficient. We good? This is one of the things that I say I'm teaching you 2 plus 2 is 4, and then the next day I'm going to say, now let's build a rocket to go to moon. Okay, so it goes like that. So it has lots of stuff that we need to learn and, and understand. Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay? Class sets and 125, correct? So that's the, the introduction for this kind of a basic syntax. So I'm going to say, uh, so, uh, and, and one more thing. You, I could have created, so in here I'm going to say integer pointer single. I could have had a single integer allocated too. Like, it's, it's completely nuts, crazy, stupid thing to do for here. I'm just showing you syntax, people. Please understand. Okay? There is absolutely no reason for me to do this. I'm just showing syntax. So instead of having an integer size, I'm going to have a size PTR, which is a pointer to an integer that is supposed to hold the size. So right off the bat, before I do that, I'm going to say size PTR is set to new int. As you see, this is a dynamic integer, but it's only one. So instead of having all these sizes over here, I have to have target of size PTR. Oopsie daisy. Oh shoot. Oh. What did it do? Uh. Oh. There you go. I think we're okay, are we? And at the end I have to say delete uh, size PTR. Again, absolutely no need for it in this case because I'm just wasting memory now. I could have had only one integer, now I have an integer and a pointer. Okay, so there is no need for it right now. For the array thingy, it made sense. In future, you'll see, you're going to have compound objects that they are huge, and those make sense to make them, you will see, but here it's not. So now, I have my integer over here for size as a single one too, and that's that. So it works the exact same way, no difference, but it's just one with pointers and the other one. So uh, that's essentially... The same thing, uh, I'm just going to save this as uh, uh, EFG, I'm going to say DMA, Dynamic Memory Allocation Syntax. Okay, so that's the syntax of Dynamic Memory Allocation, and brings us back to this. When you create a pointer, when you create a pointer for dynamic memory allocation, always set it to null pointer. This is the old version. The new version, just put the curly brackets in front of it, the aggregate thingy, right? That, because it defaults everything to zero, that essentially means null pointer. Null PTR is like capital N-U-L-L in C. It's a null pointer. It means it's a pointer that the address inside of it is zero. A null pointer in dynamic memory allocation is an unused pointer. That's why at any moment of time we delete a pointer, we have to get a habit to set it to null afterwards, to indicate it's done with it. 
because a pointer with garbage in it is not recognizable with a valid pointer that is actually pointing to somewhere. A pointer with garbage in it, you think it's an address. You want to go do something in it and it's going to crash. So make sure always keep it null, okay? And do not use null pointers because they are pointing to null and you put something over there, you've got to get segmentation fault. It means you're out of your segment of memory and it's going to kill your program. Always make sure when you are doing dynamic memory allocation, you track your size. You stay within the size. Even if you go one further, you're going to crash. So you create, this is the most common way of crashing. You create a character, string of characters for uh, a name, okay? And by mistake, you forgot to add that plus one for null termination, and you add only one little character extra. That may cause in a crash. And you should pray to whatever you believe in for it to make it crash. The worst type of memory problem is the one that does not crash. Because it will crash when you are in worst situation of your life and you have to go back and fix it. Okay? That's why dynamic memory allocation is very tricky. You don't obsessively following the rules. You're going to have bugs that takes years to fix. Okay? It's extremely important. It doesn't have any signature. If you go one byte further, if the operating system is not a good one and the, the memory is within your segment, it might not crash. And it crashes seven years, eight years, ten years from now when you least expect it. And they call you back, come over here, your program crashed. Why? I have to walk through it and find out how. And a week passes your code, you don't know what you have done before. Okay? Always delete when you're done. Always not to have memory leak. And make sure that you always, uh, uh, what should we call it, uh, use the pointer uh, uh, when it's set to something. If you just have a pointer created, you don't set it to null, there is garbage in it. It's going to crash if you try to use it. When you are creating a single unit, it's a single unit. You create, you delete it as a single unit. I just explained that to you, right? Uh, and that's it. These are the basic syntax of dynamic memory allocation. And memory allocation afterwards is uh, something that we're going to go after later. So we're going to talk about more dynamic memory allocation the next day you're coming in. And the workshop that you're getting is about that. So. Uh, any questions down to this point? OK. Go for a break. I'm going to pause this. So dynamic memory allocation. How do we do it and, and uh, go through all the uh, stuff that we need to know about dynamic memory allocation? We just talked about it, and we mentioned that if you allocate, if you create a pointer, do not use a raw pointer. Make sure you do your dynamic memory allocation, then use it. That's a very common mistake. Another thing that you need to do is to always make sure a pointer that you are creating is null when you are not using it. Okay? It's like a, <laughs> it's like a um, cup that you always want to keep it clean. Okay? Always do that. Always keep your memory, uh, your, your, your pointers uh, null right after deletion or right after creation. Whenever you are not using them after deletion, make sure you set them to null. Stay within the memory. Don't go out. I mentioned if you go one extra, what's going to happen. <clears throat> when you want to resize your memory or for any reason reuse memory to Point to another location than before, make sure you delete beforehand. That's the key in dynamic memory reallocation. So you point it to something, 30 integers, and you see the amount of information that is coming in. So you want to resize memory. You have to occupy more memory and then copy and yada yada. If you want to reuse your pointer, you have to always make sure that the old memory that you've had 
is deleted. We're going to go through extensive uh, programming techniques to make sure you do that and nothing goes wrong, but always make sure before you create a new size, you delete the old one not to have memory leak. And that is a very, very, very common way of having memory leak, and there's no way to detect it. Of course, there are utilities that help us detect memory leak, and when you're submitting using Submitter, there is something called Valgrind, uh, or Valgrind, whatever it is, that, that we attach to it. So after you submit, we execute your program using that tool. That tool measures the amount of memory before and after, and sees how many memory you uh, allocated and how many you released. If you have a leak, it's going to tell you. So um, uh, that's one of the things. You're going to make sure that you always delete the memory before you use it. And then uh, uh, and, and make sure that the always a correct state of an unused memory is null and you always keep track of the data and you set that one to zero too. When you allocate the memory, update the data size so you know exactly how much you have. And when you're done, you delete it, make sure uh, you are not going to uh, uh, leave it as empty. And after everything is deleted and gone, you set it back to null. That is extremely important. Always delete the memory exactly how you create it. If you delete the, if you allocate the memory with square brackets, you delete the memory with square bracket. If it's single, you do single. If you do, don't do that, then you're going to have memory leak. When reusing pointers, always make sure they are actually not being used. You don't need to check a pointer to see if it's null or not before deleting. Delete has that mechanism inside, which means if you're not sure, just delete it. If it's null, nothing's going to happen. Okay? But if you have some memory that you are pointing, you want some unfinished business with it, take care of that business and then delete it. Okay, so checking the pointer to see if it's not equal to null helps you understand if this memory is being used or not. If it's used, probably you have some data you want to save, you have stuff you want to deal with, I don't know. If you have unfinished business, take care of it and then delete that one. Delete it. That's extremely important. Reuse memory with new size and specs at all times. Make sure you always, always update the size and you stay within the amount of memory that you are in. Okay? Now, quickly, it's, it's 125 it ends, right? Okay, I'm going to go through all these slides again. We're going to talk about memory resizing the next day you are coming in, and we're going to get it a little more encapsulated. So uh, the workshop is going to be up. You're going to look at it, probably going to freak out, but it's okay. It's... Uh, it's um, like right off bat, it goes to dynamic memory allocation. So not only you have a dynamic array of a structure, but each structure has a dynamic allocation in it. So, so it's a double dynamic memory allocation. Kind of uh, start you in your way so you will never forget how it works. Uh, but it is completely in detail and tells you how it works. Lab, the lab part is extremely instructed but it's more complicated than the do-it-yourself one. The do-it-yourself one, you don't have any dynamic memory inside the structure. It's just one thing that you're doing, but the, the lab part, you really have to take care of the memory properly. And uh, this is one of those labs that students get pissed off because they think they have done it, and they submit, and they see the Valkyrie and says, you have memory leak down there. Careful, OK? Um, questions? Suggestions? <laughs> yes? No. No, no. A program with memory leaks is worth nothing. Okay? It, the program won't allow you to have memory leak. The submitter won't allow you. If you have memory leak, it tells you you have memory leak. So I literally, in my submitter, go check the output of Valgrind to see if it has the message for memory leak. If it does, then I won't allow you to submit. Uh, that's it. Have a beautiful day, and I'll see you soon.